Weather awareness is one of the most important things to have while flying, and it's just as important to have before you commit to a flight to avoid situations that could be anywhere from uncomfortable to deadly. For fair weather flyers, like Powered Parachute pilots, it's even more important. On this episode of the Powered Parachute Show, we talk about my top 10 weather checks I like to make before flying, and we're doing it right now. For pilots of all kinds, weather is important to be aware of before flight. That doesn't just mean the current weather, but being aware of how conditions may change through the duration of the flight. Powered parachutes are some of the most weather sensitive aircraft out there. Hot air balloons and other very light aircraft have similar sensitivities. For powered parachute pilots, there are a variety of tools available for both learning about current conditions and forecasting things to come. If you have a favorite weather website, app, or other resource of your own, please leave a link in the comments for others. I'll pin some of my favorites in the comments too. And as we get rolling here, please take a moment to subscribe if you want to see more aviation content like this. I really appreciate it. And with no further ado, this is my top 10 list of weather conditions I like to look at before I take off. Number one is surface winds. Far and away, surface winds are the thing I look at most. Surface winds are critical because they are going to determine how clean your wing, kite up, and takeoff will be. Everyone has their own limitations based on their skill set, their equipment, their terrain, and their comfort level. The basics I look at are wind speed, wind direction, and directional consistency. With powered parachutes, the lower the wind speed, the better. A general rule is that if it's so windy that you're having a difficult time managing to lay out your wing, then it's too windy for you to fly. My comfort level goes down a lot after five to seven knots of wind. Even more important, passenger and student comfort levels go down a lot faster. That's because when you fly at lower altitudes, the mechanical turbulence created by brisker winds going over trees, buildings, and such can make for a rowdy ride. Wind direction is important because you always want to begin your takeoff by kiting your parachute into the wind. If you can't do that, the risk of a rollover is real and can be embarrassing as well as expensive. For a similar reason, a wind that is changing direction can offer a lot of challenge. If it's changing quickly, try another day. If it's changing in a predictable manner and you're watching a wind sock upwind while you're getting ready to fly, you may be able to take off at just the right moment. Can be tricky, but experienced pilots do it when they really want to get into the air. Winds aloft are number two. As soon as you get into the sky, you're beginning to deal with winds aloft. In general aviation, pilots worry about winds at 3,000, then 6,000, then 9,000, and so on in 3,000 foot increments. For us, we're concerned with winds at treetop level to perhaps a couple of thousand feet. Our concerns are very similar to hot air balloon pilot's concerns. And luckily, there are balloon pilot tricks that work for powered parachutes too. By the way, the one thing that is almost guaranteed is that whatever winds you're dealing with on the ground will increase once you begin flying. The best you can expect is for the winds to gradually increase with altitude. You certainly don't want them to double at 100 feet if you're taking off in a five knot wind though. Here are three ways to check for winds aloft. A forecasting tool like ryancarlton.com is very handy. It provides the hot air balloon forecast and probably provides it for an airport near you. It forecasts surface winds, then winds at about 100 feet above ground level, then around 250 feet, then 500 feet, and so on. The altitudes seem a little arbitrary at times and they vary from forecast to forecast, but the information is good. There are other sites like windy.com and ventusky.com. The colors on both of those sites make them even more interesting. Another great way to check on winds aloft is to simply watch the sky. Treetops, chimneys, smokestacks, and the movement of low clouds are all useful. Here's a hint. When watching clouds, look at them compared to something you can sight against like the roof of a hangar. You could really note cloud movement when you use a static reference point rather than just looking up in the open sky. Finally, for the enthusiastic, you can launch a low-budget weather balloon. Party balloon kits with helium are available at retail outlets. Inflate one and launch it. If it goes relatively straight up, you're good to go. If it darts off near horizontal at some low altitude, perhaps you should wait to fly another day. Number three is whether the sky will be clear or overcast. As the sun begins to rise, it heats the ground and that causes thermals. A sky clear of clouds is going to allow the sun to heat the ground that much faster, creating more and stronger thermals. Thermals are vertical wind, but not in a nice organized way. 
Thermals are bumpy, and with the big wings and low speeds that we fly, that bump can become uncomfortable. Again, this is something that normally bothers your passenger more than it should bother you. But if a nice smooth flight is something you want, a nice clear sky a few hours after sunrise is going to ruin that for you. So that of course means that you can enjoy a lot more flying during an overcast day, everything else being equal. Overcast conditions mean that the sun never really gets to heat up the ground and cause those uncomfortable thermals. Temperature is number four. Flying is an outdoor activity with the wind in your face. Temperature determines whether that wind is too hot, too cold, or just right. Too cold can just be miserable. But then I'm someone who doesn't snowmobile, doesn't snow ski, and doesn't ice fish. If you like those activities, maybe flying in sub-freezing temperatures will be your thing. Just be warned, however cold it is on the ground, it normally gets much worse when you're flying due to wind chill effect with wind speeds of around 30 miles an hour. And happily, the rule of things cooling holds on warmer days too. Once you take off, get the wind in your face, and climb to cooler altitudes, things get a lot more comfortable. But to get there, you still need to take time on the ground to set up your wing. Laying out your wing before takeoff and packing your wing after landing isn't that stressful under normal conditions, but it can become a chore under a hot summer sun. But worse, higher temperatures make your aircraft perform poor, which leads us to number five, density altitude. Density altitude is the combination of altitude and temperature that can really degrade the performance of most any aircraft. The higher the altitude, the thinner the air, and the higher the temperature, the thinner the air. The combination of the two effects is called density altitude, or the altitude that your aircraft believes it is flying at. It works out that the higher the density altitude, the poorer your wing, propeller, and engine perform. That translates into longer takeoff rolls, slower climbs, faster descents, and lower possible payloads. While summer flying is the most fun because you can fly in t-shirts and shorts, that weather is what works your equipment the hardest. Temperature dew point spread is number six. Dew point is a temperature, varying according to pressure and humidity, below which water droplets begin to condense and fog can form. You don't even need to know how dew point is calculated, but you do need to know that the closer the actual temperature gets to the dew point, the higher the chances are of fog forming. A temperature dew point spread of zero degrees means that fog is very likely, although oddly not guaranteed. If you're planning a flight for the next morning and you see a low temperature dew point spread, realize that you may be waiting a while after sunrise before you can fly. Number seven is visibility. The sport pilot rules say that we need at least three miles of visibility to fly in most of the airspace we find ourselves in. Oddly, ultralight pilots and private pilots only need one mile of visibility to fly in a lot of that same airspace. However, even though sometimes I fly ultralights and I do have private pilot credentials for powered parachutes, I prefer to wait for three miles before I commit to the sky. That's because very often one mile of visibility can turn into a mere quarter mile or less just as easily as it can turn into three miles of visibility. That's because the conditions that bring us one mile are actually a little unstable. If the temperature goes down just a degree, the conditions get ripe for even more reduced visibility. In other words, a small hole in the fog is nothing but a sucker hole. Don't let yourself get sucked into it. Flying in fog is worse than driving in fog since you don't even have a yellow line to follow. Clouds are number eight. Clouds tell us a lot about the sky. They tell us about thermal activity, possible thunderstorms, winds aloft, and other weather. They are well worth paying attention to and continuing to pay attention to after takeoff. This is especially true late in the afternoon when a particularly enthusiastic cumulus cloud can turn into a cumulonimbus cloud and bring with it all the delights of a thunderstorm, including high winds, heavy rain, lightning, and other goodies. Number nine is rain. Rain hurts at 30 miles per hour. I just thought I would say that up front. But more importantly, rain makes your parachute heavier, and any water collecting in the chute after long exposure to precipitation can make the wing tail heavy and a little closer to stall. If you get caught in a little bit of rain while you're flying, it's not a disaster. Just recognize that you will need to spend some time drying out your parachute once you're back on the ground. Packing a parachute away wet and leaving it that way for any length of time just sets it up for mildew damage. However, heavy rain is to be avoided. It's not only uncomfortable, but it also has a habit of coming with things like lightning and wind. If you see something on the radar, stay on the ground. If you're in the sky and see rain clouds heading your way, 
get on the ground. Even flying under Virga, the kind of rain that evaporates before it gets close to the ground, can be a turbulent ride. And we finish up with number 10, fronts. Weather fronts could easily have gone to the front of this list rather than the back. The movement of weather fronts are something that gets cooked into all of the weather forecast models that you will normally access. The big color weather maps that you see on the local news with moving weather fronts actually are a big deal. They can indicate what kind of weather changes are coming and approximately when you can expect them. Sometimes clouds come with those fronts, but it's possible that the only thing you will notice on the ground is a gust front, a high wind out of seemingly nowhere. Seemingly. And remember, wind is the item on the top of the list. If you look at these 10 weather items before you commit to any flight, you will increase your chances of happy and enjoyable flights. Finally, if you are interested in powered parachute flight instruction in either the Midwest or in Florida, please visit the link to easyflight.com in the comments. And please remember to subscribe. Thanks so much for watching and blue skies.